Let us call ourselves to worship with Psalm number 16. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, they are noble, in whom is all my delight. Those who choose another God multiply their sorrows. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion, and my cup you hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. For you do not give me up to Sheol, or let your faithful one see the pit. You show me the path of light. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand our pleasures forevermore. The word of the Lord. Please join me in our prayer of confession. Mighty God, in whom we know the power of redemption, you stand among us in the shadows of our time. As we move through every sorrow and trial of this life, uphold us with knowledge of the final morning, when in the glorious presence of your risen Son, we will share in his resurrection redeemed and restored to the fullness of life, and forever freed to be your people. Amen. Our first scripture reading is from 1 Peter, chapter 1, verses 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now, for a little while, you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that though perishable is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The word of the Lord. Let us offer a special prayer for these times. Gracious and loving God, we come together as a community and offer prayers as brothers and sisters in faith. 
We pray for those who have contracted coronavirus. We pray for their healing and recovery. We pray for their loved ones, who are of those who are sick, those who are separated, those who are isolated, and taking care of someone who is ill. We pray for our farmers, our drivers, the delivery people, the grocery and pharmacy workers. We pray for all those who are still needing to go to work during these times and risk exposure every day. We pray for all our healthcare workers, that their needs are met, that they are able to take care of others and stay safe and healthy. We pray for their exhaustion and they find rest and relief. God, we pray for all those who are experiencing fear and anxiety, that their minds and spirits feel your peace and presence. We pray for those who are out of work, for the students and teachers educating from home, for those who are facing food insecurity and all those facing financial burdens. God, we lift up our small businesses that were able once again to open their doors. We thank you for the ability of our churches to be the people, even as the doors of our buildings to houses of worship remain closed. We pray for our public officials, for wisdom and for guidance. We pray for our scientists, that they are quickly and safely able to find a treatment or cure. We pray for everyone around this world. We are united in our tragedy. May we come together in shared solidarity. God, may this prayer provide comfort, love, and hope to all. In your loving and precious name we pray. Amen. Our Gospel reading is from John chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where his disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. 
and the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails on his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. The word of the Lord. One. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Have you ever considered how many things we know to be true today would have seemed absolutely ridiculous in the first century? Imagine trying to tell Pontius Pilate that the earth revolves around the sun. Now, here was a man who was firmly believed that he was knew more than any human being of his time. It was common in that day to refer to kings as sons of God. They knew everything, which is the reason Jesus came to be referred to as the Son of God and King of the Jews. So Pilate would have given short shrift to anyone claiming to know something he did not know. And he would have been certain beyond any doubt that the sun revolves around the earth. It was as simple as looking up at the sky and affirming the obvious that the sun was making a circle around the earth. After all, we see that every day and any idiot would know for certain that this is the way things are. Of course, it's also completely wrong. And today, any fifth grader knows that the earth circles the sun. But that there are seven other planets and some dwarf planets doing the same thing, and that the sun is one of billions upon billions of suns in an unfathomably huge universe, where our Milky Way galaxy is a visible diameter between 150 and 200,000 light years, and it's a small dark dot in a dark void. Our galaxy is estimated to have between 100 and 400 billion stars and more than 100 billion planets. The dark matter halo around the Milky Way is about, oh, two million light years around. <laughs> Hard to figure. What the heck is dark matter? Why, it's the non-luminous material that's postulated to exist in space that would take several forms, including weakly interacting particles called dark matter or high energy particles called hot dark matter. Aren't you glad I'll let you know about that. It's a theory. And who knows, it might prove to be about as good a theory as the idea that the sun revolves around the earth proved to be. Today, though, it's generally believed to be true based on the available evidence. While it's true that we have a lot of evidence, it's also true that Pontius Pilate would have believed that he had all the evidence he needed that was completely wrong. Now we can reverse the analogy. Instead of looking out in the universe, let's look inside. Scientists today are currently racing to find either a cure or a vaccine for a microscopic virus that's killing thousands of people all over the world. Now we have come a long way. We now have a machine called CRISPR that allows geneticists to actually change the genetic code within a cell. Imagine that. In the first century, they thought disease was punishment by God for sin. We now know that the real culprit is something impossible to see with the human eye. 
Humanity has figured out ways to see things that people in Jesus' time could not even fathom. We've harnessed unseen radio waves to ex exchange not only words, but images through the, <laughs> through the air. We use infrared and ultraviolet imagery to detect a, a lost child lost in the woods by sensing the heat of human bodies. Wouldn't a first century shepherd have loved to use that te technology to find a lost sheep? We've also learned that most of the world is empty space. Even rocks and trees that seem so solid are made up of atomic structures that in turn have subatomic particles whizzing about a nucleus. It's hard to tell if these particles are particles at all, if they're, they're moving so fast and they're so tiny. And yet scientists have learned how to split those particles off from the centers to unleash tremendous amounts of energy. All of the things that we've learned over the centuries are very hard to grasp. The sheer immensity of the universe is really incomprehensible. And the fact that we've learned to control things we can't possibly see with our eyes just boggles the mind. We can empathize with Thomas. Why should we expect to understand things that we currently have no capacity to understand? We say to Jesus, show me. The great philosopher and theologian Calvin had it right. And the, of course, I'm referring to the cartoon character Calvin. Sometimes a cartoon character can get to the heart of philosoph philosophical debate much more easily than a theologian or a philosopher. Humor is often able to cut through all the polysyllables and confusion of philosophers. Calvin comes out with words no typical six-year-old would ever use which is part of the fun of the comic strip. And so in this cartoon, which I will show you, Calvin says he has an ontological quandary. As no six-year-old and very few 60-year-olds would understand, ontology is the study of whether or not something exists. And it's also the study of the degree to which we know whether something does or does not exist. Calvin is looking into the deep philosophical question of whether or not no seeums actually exist. After all, he contends, you can't see them, hence the name, no seeums. He says, you can't prove anything exists that you can't see. And as no six-year-old would ever say, Calvin points out that verification is ruled out by definition. In other words, can't see it, can't prove it. Sounds a bit like the Doubting Thomas, doesn't it? Of course, Calvin's ontological quandary is quite easy to resolve. All he needs to do is stand still for a minute, and he will have all the proof he needs to see that no seams really do exist. Maybe it's not so easy with the risen Christ. When we think about the doubts the disciple named Thomas had, we carry a bit of our own baggage with us. Let's admit that when we think of Thomas, we, what we think of is his doubts. We tend to forget that he is the disciple who was all for following Jesus into Judea when the others feared it was too dangerous. He's also referred to as a disciple who sought to understand the way to the kingdom of heaven. And yet, only John has this particular story about his doubts. The only mention of Thomas in the other three Gospels merely mentions his name on a list of disciples and nothing more. And while we're mentioning things that the early Christians did not know, Christians had no idea until 1945 when the manuscripts were, were discovered in Nag Hammadi that a writer claiming to be Thomas wrote a book of sayings attributed to Jesus. Uh, about half of the sayings in the Gospel of Thomas are found in the other Gospels, but the other half are not found in any of them. Uh, some of the stories are a little strange, but it's definitely worth reading. The point is, in the first place, we don't know everything there is to know. We're still learning. We will always be learning. And therefore, our entire context of understanding the world will always be changing, or at least it should be. Doubt is healthy. It leads to a careful examination of what we think we know to be true. 
and the ability to adapt when we learn new things. We should never expect not to have any doubts ourselves. Doubt does not overcome faith. Faith overcomes doubt. Faith cannot and should not replace doubt. We can take in new information without shattering our faith. We can accept that the sun does not revolve around the earth, even though the scripture refers to the earth as being mounted on pillars and something like a dome separating the earth from the waters and the sun going around the earth. Knowing that there's no waters above the earth makes, does not make the ancient story any less beautiful. Does knowledge destroy faith? Does having doubt mean you don't have faith? Well, if you're looking at Jesus as the basis for your faith, you have a pretty clear answer to the question. He picked doubters, betrayers, as disciples. He founded his church on the man who denied him three times. Our doubts are in good company, and so is our faith. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. May it be so for us. Amen. May your faith overcome all doubt, and may your doubts nourish your faith, and make it come alive, shining light through all darkness. Amen.